What's up, everybody? We're out here at the Punta Gorda Airport, still filming some stuff for At The Movies. As I said, this is gonna be the biggest and best one we have. But before we get to At The Movies, we gotta talk about book club. And I am so excited to have a friend, an advisor, a mentor of mine and our churches with us in person, the author of his own book. We are part of the reason our church is who we are and where we are is because of Pastor Rob and his influence and investment in us. And so I need you to help me give a huge Cape Christian welcome to my friend, Pastor Rob Ketterling. Amen. It's good to be here with you guys. Uh, I got to say this, we love your church, and I'm glad that I'm here for the uh, book club thing, but I want to lower your expectations. Like, that had like an Agatha Christie, Sherlock Holmes feel, all those hardcover books. This is just paperback. That's all it is, just paperback, all right? So we'll get there in a minute, but um, we do love your church, love your church, and when the hurricane hit, uh, our church was able to take up an offering, was able to send it down and uh, be a part, and, and we actually came on site, had some people serving here, and I saw your church in action with my own eyes, and I saw that you're a real church helping real needs, and you're not just playing church, you're being the church. And so when I saw that, I said, I love this church. Of course, love your pastor and have known him for years. And um, how many know, like, he is high energy, obviously, right? You know, <laughs> high energy and, like, wants to get into trouble, and I love that too. So you put us together, with, and it's just a never a dull moment. When I was actually bringing the check down and coming down to see what was going on, um, I called him. I said, hey, I'm coming with the check, and we're bringing it from the church. And he said, oh, I'm just about to meet with uh, Ron DeSantis and the chief of police, and there's, like, 50 people here. And he goes, do you want to you wanna come to the meeting? And I go, sure. He goes, let me check if I can get you in. How many know he got me in, right? You know, that's the pastor he is. And next thing you know, I'm in a meeting with Ron DeSantis. I'm like, hi, I'm from Minnesota. You know, <laughs> I'd vote for you. You know, like, all right. Yeah. So, but we're having fun. And he stayed at our house. Your pastor stayed at our house during the Ryder Cup in Minnesota. And so I had uh, your pastor, so he was there. And then Chris Harrell, you know Chris, like he's spoken here before, so he was with us. And then John Bevere. So the three of them were staying in our home. We'd go to Ryder Cup golf all day, and then we'd come home and talk about it all night. My wife was like, I'm going crazy with golf, you know? So love your pastor, and uh, can I say this too? Thank you for letting him have this time away. He said you're having this time away, and that uh, he's bringing in different guests and uh, as a pastor that started our church from 13 people and has grown it to thousands and the stress that's been there, my church has done the same thing with, for my wife and I. They've said, this is a break time. You get to have ease and just have a uh, getaway and then come back to us fresh. And you might say, well, my church, you know, like my job is tough too. Listen, there's a spiritual weight that is on a pastor. There's a spiritual weight that you may not understand. The Apostle Paul said this, I've been beaten, I've been hungry, I've been shipwrecked, I've, had all, I've been abandoned, all these things. Plus, he puts in his own category, I have the weight of the church. There's a weight of the church that's there that, that he's experiencing, and when he gets that rest time with family, God's gonna strengthen him, and you're gonna get a stronger, healthier pastor. Now, just in case he's watching online with the others that are watching online, can we show our love and appreciation for Pastor Corey right now and show him clap? That's for you in case you're watching. Now, we love Fort Myers area. We uh, have been coming down here. Uh, well, uh, once COVID hit and the rest of the nation was locked down except for Florida, we're like, let's go for freedom. And we came down. <laughs> And on our fifth trip down, we're like, this is like our second home. So uh, Fort Myers has helped us with our sanity, and uh, we love this area. And I want to let you know that in a sermon the other day, so many people from Minnesota, where our church is, have been moving to Florida. Literally, in the sermon the other day, I said, we can't all move to Florida. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, you can. Yeah, all right. Yeah. I was like, no, you can't. Stay in Minnesota. You're practically a missionary if you stay. Like, come on, stay. <laughs> So, but anyways, I do love the church that we get to pastor. It's called River Valley Church. Uh, we have nine locations, soon to be 10 up in Minnesota. And uh, some of you might know our church through some of the music. Uh, Hope Has a Name is a song that a lot of churches have been singing. And then on Air One right now, uh, uh, I'm in love with everything you do. That's from our church, from our youth group. And then Sunrise is also from our youth group. So it's fun to hear our church on the radio when we're traveling. But uh, love our church, multi-site, huge into missions, 
and uh, not staying put, continuing to grow just like yours and saying there's more people to reach, let's keep going. Um, I want to show you a picture of my family real quick. My wife is with me here this weekend, and, uh, but you'll see my wife back in the middle there, and, and this will make sense in just a minute, the story that I'm going to tell. So my wife, Becca, and then our oldest son on the far left, Connor, with his wife, Alexia, and then our youngest son, Logan, with his wife, Michaela. And then our oldest son, Connor, and Alexia have given us our first grandchild, Beckham Robert. So life has changed. Yes, all the grandparents. Yeah, everybody's like, wait till you have a grandchild. You'll be glad you didn't kill your kids. Praise God. Yes, it's true. It's true. Like, wow. So I didn't know I could love somebody that much. Uh, so just wanted you to see the family and then put a little context on the story I'm going to tell. The book that I'm going to be um, talking about, and it's not just a book. There's a sermon. There's all sorts of sermons, a sermon series, a small group curriculum. It's called Keep the Change. And uh, it's really a sequel to my first book, but if you get this one, it summarizes the first book. And uh, we're going to be selling these. They're normally $18.95. Uh, they're $15. I've signed all of them uh, in advance and uh, would love for you to get one, read it, pass it on, uh, help people to keep change and to make change that will help them live a more abundant life. Now, um, how did this start that I have a sequel? Where does the first book? All right, we'll start there. I was out to eat with my wife and another couple in our church. So we're out there having dinner and he says, Pastor Rob, you are so high maintenance. Like your wife like pays all the bills. Um, she picks out even the clothes that you wear for church. Like she takes care of you. You're so high maintenance. What'd you ever do if you lost Becca? And I said, I don't know what, I mean, I would be a basket case if I lost Becca and we're eating. And I said, and if I lost Becca, I'd have to lose weight. And, and she's like, what? if I was to die, you would have to lose weight? And I was like, did I say that out loud? You know, like, like, okay, to put in perspective, I used to be an extra large, okay? Now I'm wearing a medium, just put it in context. So I'm, I'm a lot bigger. I was kind of really fat and I had a big gut and I used to say it was like a pulpit blister, you know, and I like, there's more of me to love. And, you know, and it's like, I look like a bowling ball right here. And, um, and she goes, and, and, and she goes, why would you, why, you would lose weight if I died? And my friend blurts out, breaking the man code. And he goes, what he's saying is he could never get an attractive woman like you being fat like that. <laughs> and then she said, you would lose weight for another woman? <laughs> And I said, baby, I will do it for you, all right? And so I went to the doctor. I said, pretend like I had a heart attack. And, and, I, and he goes, did you? I go, no, but just pretend. Like, I'm just changing my life. He goes, nobody does that. I said, I'm going to do that. And when he said that, I thought, okay, there's got to be something in the Bible. And there is. In the Old Testament, there's a story about a guy by the name of Josiah. When he has the word of God read to him, he's like, oh, we're doing things wrong. We got to change. Before God ever judges me as the king, I want to change. And he changes before he has to. So then I preached that sermon. It became a book. Now I have a sequel from this, and I actually uh, changed my life. I just, you know, started eating salmon, doing the workouts, doing all the stuff. Watch what I got rid of the little Debbie snack cakes. You know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I did all the changes. You would think that making all those changes, like, perfect, it would, it would, I would never have any struggle. Five years after I make all these changes, I have a heart attack. Here's a picture of me. I'm in the hospital. I have a heart attack. That was the before. Sorry, that's the fat Rob and the skinny Rob. Now that's me in the, in the hospital. I mean, I made all these changes. It's not fair. Like, you shouldn't make this. See, some of you are like, see, that's why I don't diet, you know, because <laughs> it doesn't work anyways, right? No, it does. It does. It does. All right. So, but go ahead and show. I want to show the heart. The doctor said, you didn't waste the change. You survived. And he said, where the red lines are, he said, those are collaterals. And those things grow when you get in shape in your heart. And they actually helped you recover. They helped you stay alive. And you never waste a change. So I just want to speak to anybody that thinks like, see, that's why I don't change. I'm good enough where I'm at. And maybe it's not weight, but you're like, that's why I don't change and get rid of that sin. At least I'm going to heaven. That's a terrible attitude. Any change that you make that, that God makes in your life will not only bless you, it'll bless others around you. It'll bless your children. It'll bless your family. It'll bless the neighbors around you. It could bless your coworkers. We are gonna make changes and keep changes in our life. And so I wanna look at this on, on keep the change in your life and what you've done. And 
And can I say right up front, this is not a weight loss sermon, all right? All right, because some of you are like, he needs it, she needs it, he needs it. No, don't do that, all right? No, don't do that. That's not what it is. This is for everything. Some of you have been facing life-controlling addictions, and you've made a change, and when you drive by that old liquor store, a voice calls out to you, and you're hanging on to your change for dear life, and I want you to keep your sobriety in Jesus' name. Some of you have old patterns that were destructive, that were killing your marriage, that you stopped, but they're calling you, those voices are calling you, I want you to keep the change in Jesus' name and not go back. And so this is gonna be something that will give you the strength to keep the change and to move forward because here's what happens. Uh, we want to hold on to the changes that we've made so far. And the Bible says this. It talks about us coming into grace and seeing Christ change our life and then holding on to it. Don't let go of the good that God has done in your life. Maybe you've said yes to Jesus for a couple years and, and the enemy is trying to steal away the joy of you walking with God. Don't let him steal that away. Hold on to the things that you've already gained in your life. Here's what it says in Philippians chapter three, verse 13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you, but we must hold on to the progress we've already made. The Apostle Paul's saying, we gotta hold on to the progress. We don't wanna go two steps forward and three steps back. We wanna hold on to the things that God has already given us the victory. We want the strength to fight the future battles ahead and we wanna hold on to the gains. And so if we're gonna keep these changes in our life, we've gotta stop getting, giving excuses and falling for the deceptions that the enemy throws at us because there's self-deceptions that we tell ourselves. And there's lies that the enemy speaks to us that causes us to lose the things that we've gained. So I'm gonna look at a few of these. And um, when I mention them, I'm just gonna do like two chapters of 10 in the book. So we're just getting started. There's so much more. But when I, when I say these things, you know, like inside, you probably be going, like, that's me, that's me. But I, I did this one time, I preached this at a church and I, I said, this excuse, and the guy goes, me. And then the next one, he's like, me again. And then at third one, he's like, me. And I was like, don't do that. All right, so just, if you know these excuses are there, you don't have to point, all right? And don't point at anybody else. All right, we got it. All right. So here's one of the things that, like you make a change for God and you make a change for good and it gives you breakthrough in an area. And then all of a sudden you have the first deception that I talk about. It's called faulty memory. You forget how bad it was. You forget how bad your bondage was. Sometimes I see people talking about their past life and they're talking about maybe in the area of drugs or alcohol and they almost talk about it like it was the glory days. Like, oh yeah, back then. No, you forget that you were one car accident from losing your life. You forget the pain that you inflicted on your family. You forget the, the anger and the fighting, and you forget that you woke up in places where you didn't even know where you were. Don't forget where you were and how far you've come because it is a problem, and the enemy of your soul tries to make you forget all the bad things and only remember a few of the pleasurable things because the Bible says that sin is pleasurable for a season, but it brings about death. And if you don't remember how bad it was, you'll all of a sudden fall into that self-deception of, you know, like, oh, I, I don't remember it being that bad. It was bad. Moses, when the Israelites were led out of Egypt, you don't know the story, the Israelites, God's people, were in slavery in Egypt. God leads them out of slavery and they face a little bit of difficulty. A little, matter of fact, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, it, it's like they're smooth sailing and then you face a little bit of difficulty. And then the devil says, oh, if you go back to where you were, it won't be difficult. Remember what it's like before you gave your life to Jesus. See, and he does that same attack. He did it to them. And here's former slaves. They get set free and they're facing a little bit of difficulty. And they're like, man, being in slavery was pretty awesome. 
Man, the food there was incredible. Remember how good the food was? It was amazing. Like, no, it wasn't. It was like gruel. But they're like, oh yeah. There's some, they forgot about the slavery. And, Mo, and Moses tells them in Deuteronomy 4, 9, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you not forget the things that your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and their children after them. He's saying, don't let it fade. You know how bad it was. You know you were in slavery and God set you free. Don't forget that. And you know what? I encourage parents to tell your children, tell your children. Like when my mom and dad were giving me, you know, dating advice, I was like, who are you? You're like old people. Like you don't know anything, you know? And all of a sudden they said, hey, let me tell you where we used to be. And they started telling me. And then my mom said, hey, I was a single mom that gave a baby up for adoption. I know what I'm talking about when I'm giving you warning. I, how many know I'm listening a whole lot better so you can share those things, never forget, because that self-deception will steal the change that you've made. Here's another one, Samson syndrome. Samson syndrome is this, and if you don't know the story, it's in Judges. Samson is uh, given supernatural strength as long as his hair is long. So he has long hair and he has supernatural, he can, he can whip up on hundreds of guys at the same time, they, he cannot lose. And he starts uh, in with this lady named Delilah. And Delilah's like, Samson, what's your strength? And he's like, oh, you know, it's just, it's just me. And she's like, no, what's the secret? And he's like, well, if you bind me up with old ropes, like, you know, I, I, I can't, I'm not strong. So she does it, and he's still strong. She's like, Samson, what is it? And he's like, well, if you bind me up with new ropes, then, I'm, then I, uh, I, I'm not strong. She does it. He's still strong. And she's like, please tell me, tell me. And then he says, well, if you braid my hair, I won't be strong. How many know he's getting really close to the edge? He's getting really close to losing all. So she braids his hair and then he still has his strength. And she's like, Samson, please tell me. And then he says, if you shave my head. Why in the world would he tell her the secret of his strength? She already tied him up with old ropes, new ropes, braided his hair. She's gonna shave his hair. See, I think Samson started thinking, I got this. I got this, it's me. It's not even my hair. I'm pretty strong, I got this, I can do it on my own. And if you don't watch it, you will fall for the Samson syndrome. If, if God has saved you out of something, you should stay as far away from it as you can. You, you don't wanna be like, well, you know, just again, take that route by the liquor store and go by, no, no. You stay away from that thing. If you think you're strong, you gotta watch out because 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says this. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Samson syndrome, you're not, it's not in your strength. God gives you the strength to stay away from those old things. All right, here's another one. Not my fault, not my fault. We, we fall into old patterns and we fall back into old sinful things and we lose the change that we made. We say, not my fault. And we become professional blame throwers. Not my fault. Think about the Bible. In Genesis, the start of the Bible, Adam and Eve, they fall into sin. God's like, what, what, what's happening here? And Adam's like, not my fault. Not my fault. Her, it was her fault. By the way, before she was here, never sinned. You brought her on, now I'm sinning. You know? God's like, what happened? She's like, not my fault, serpent, serpent. If you went to made a serpent, we'd be good. How many know, like, we're just trying to do that. We do it all the time, not my fault. And we become professional blame throwers and we throw it around to everyone else. I especially wanna to talk to men with this one. I've counseled a lot of men and in our church and sometimes when they fall in purity and they mess up sexually, They'll come in and say, well, it's not my fault. I mean, if my wife would, you know, do this, then I wouldn't. You know, I'm like, eh, wrong answer. That's a professional blame thrower. God does not give you permission to blame other people. You, you were drawn away by these things. Stop blaming and becoming a professional blame thrower. It's a terrible way to live. And we, we've got to just own up to the things that we do. We have to own up to the fact that I chose that. I fell into that deception. I mean, I, I look at our political leaders. I mean, how many know, like, wouldn't it be a refreshing if a political leader just said, like, I did it. It's my fault. It's my fault. <laughs> like, we'd probably all die. We'd be like, are you kidding me? Because what they do is like, never happened. Not my fault. It, 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 first of all, it never happened. And they're like, well, it did happen, but it's not my fault. Never was my fault. You're crazy to think it's my fault. I just wanted to be honest. I mean, it'd be amazing if they'd say, like, yeah, we really messed up there, but we'll fix it, you know? 
They don't do it. Let's stop being professional blame throwers and saying it's not my fault. All right. Are these making sense to you? Are these making sense? I mean, some of these, okay, all right. You're not, you're not like me, me, but you, if they're making sense. All right, here's another one. Because I, I want you to keep the change in your life. You've come too far. You've gained too much. I don't want you to lose it, okay? Neither does God. He's cheering for you to keep those gains and to add to them. You say this, well, just this once I'll do it. Just this once. I'll, I'll, I'll just do it. It's not gonna be a habit, but I'm just gonna do it just this once. Now, I've noticed this one in the area of money. Now, it happens everywhere. But you say, you know what? I'm just gonna bonus myself. I'm just gonna give myself that, and it's just, just this once. I'm gonna pad my expense account just this once. Just, it, you know, they don't pay me enough, so it's just this once. I remember having uh, dinner with a guy. He's like, it started with just this once. And I sold a side deal. I just did a side deal. I, I, I side deal and made a little side money and selling this equipment. And he said, then just this once turned into another time and another time until the side deal got shipped to the wrong address. And then he got busted and lost it all. And I sat there in the restaurant and he's weeping. He said, I thought I'd only do it once. And then it turned into a lifestyle. And now here I am, I've lost everything. Just this once changes your direction. I learned this from a bill collector. A matter of fact, you know who it was? It was Joe Anderson. If you remember the guy who just spoke the other day about all the tragedies in his life and God bringing him through alcohol and his, being, his father-in-law being shot on the wedding night and the crash that he had, he was on staff. It was at our church. That's where all this happened. I was, I was the efficient at his wedding, okay? But when he started at our church before any of this happened, he was a bill collector. And he used to call people and, and get them to just pay $20. He just get paid $20 on like a $10,000 debt. And he said, I learned this. If I could get them to just once make a payment, just once, I would change their direction. If they were running from their debt and they even paid something as little as $20, I could get them to turn the other way. Matter of fact, in the other service before this, um, one of the people in the church said, I was a banker. And if we could get people to pay a dollar, one dollar, they would turn from running from their debt and they would pay it off. One dollar. Because it changes the direction. Don't fall for the lie that just this once you have changed your direction and you will lose what you've worked so hard to gain. All right, here's another one. No one can see. No one can see. People in recovery say we're only as sick as our secrets. We say, but no one can see. I got these secrets and no one can see. It's behind me. But here's the thing. You think nobody can see. You look left, you looked right, you looked in front of you, you looked behind you, but you forgot, you gotta look up. You gotta look up. Somebody is seeing. Hebrews 4.13 says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, he sees. And even if you pull off the perfect thing that nobody sees, he sees, he sees. And, and we don't wanna live in that lie of, ah, nobody can see, nobody can see. I can, I can, I can, I can do it, it's safe to do this. I'm convinced that people see us everywhere and we just don't realize it. We think they don't see us. And maybe because, um, you know, we have a high profile church in Minnesota. And, but the other day we were even in baggage claim at Fort Myers Airport. We're at the airport and this husband and wife come walking up to me and they go, are you Pastor Rob Ketterling? And I just thought, oh boy, oh boy. And I said, maybe, <laughs> you know, like, and I said, yeah, I am. I said, why? And they said, oh, thank you for fighting to open the churches in Minnesota during COVID. I was like, Phew. I mean, people know where you are. I'll never forget one day, my wife and I, dream trip. We get a dream trip. We get a month off like that, like you're giving your pastor. We get the month off and we've saved up. We're going to do a dream trip to go to Australia, to Sydney, Australia for New Year's Eve to see the fireworks. And if you don't know the picture, it's like the greatest fireworks show around. I mean, there's a million people there. And we're there, a million people. And I, I talked to her, I said, oh, it's the, it's the first day of our vacation. I said, this is going to be amazing fireworks. Nobody knows us. We're here, there's a million people, we're anonymous, and we're just here, it's just you and me, I'm gonna look into your eyes, it's gonna be the most amazing time. I know sooner get done finishing saying, like, I'm gonna look into your eyes, it's gonna be amazing, Allison, I hear behind me, Pastor Rob, is that you? 
And I thought like somebody was punking me. Like they just heard me talking and I was like, yeah, whatever. And I turned around, they go, it is you. We go to your church. I'm like, no, no, this is a special moment. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't say that out loud, but I thought it inside. <laughs> I was like, no, it's great to see you. Pull up a blanket. Ah. Okay. I'm telling you what, you may not have somebody say, hey, John, is he you? Hey, Sarah, is that you? But the Lord's seeing it. Don't lose what you've worked so hard for because you fall for the lie that nobody can see. God still sees it. All right, here's another one. No harm, no foul. Like, I don't feel. Like, I'm falling back into old behaviors and it feels good. I mean, I don't feel like I'm losing ground. It just, I feel like I'm pretty good and I just, you know, it's no harm. I, I don't feel any harm. Take, for instance, my cholesterol. It was terrible. It was 230. And now I've lowered it down way lower, all right? I'm working out, lost the weight, done all this stuff. I went to the doctor and he said, hey, I just want to tell you, he goes, your cholesterol's in the good range, but your bad cholesterol's a little too high. Even though you can't feel it, we want to help you and we want you to do a little more exercise, even though you can't feel it. It's not like I, you know, wake up in the day, I'm like, man, my cholesterol feels a little cloggy. I need an oil change. You know, it's like, it doesn't do that, right? I just don't feel it. So, but he's like, even though you can't feel it, we can see it from these tests. And even though you don't feel the destruction that's happening when you start sliding away from God and you start sliding into old patterns and habits, you know what? It's still killing you. It's still bringing, the Bible talks about in James that sin, it starts small and you get seduced away, but ultimately then it brings about death. That's what happens. And so even though you can't feel it, you can't fall for that excuse. Listen to what 1 Timothy 5, 24 says. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. See, some people do things and they feel it right away or they get caught all the time or their conscience, oh, it, it right there, it hits them up front. Others think because it's behind them and they don't feel it and nobody saw it and it's back there that it didn't happen. It happened and it's trailing with you and you don't wanna fall for that. You don't wanna go back into those old habits and those things that, that God saved you out of. All right, I got a couple more and I, we got time for them. So I wanna give you these. These are all in the first two chapters. Here's one. I'm not as bad as you can fill in the blank. That's the excuse. Like, well, you know, I mean, I know she said I have an anger problem, but I'm not as bad as Troy, you know? And I mean, you know, thank God she's not married to Troy, you know? I mean, he's terrible, you know? No, you're not competing with Troy, okay? You're not, you're, you're not on, like, trying to get into heaven on a curve. Like, okay, God, I just need to beat a couple of people. And, you know, I got, you know, that's not what you're trying to do. You are trying to say, God, I want to be the best version of me that I can possibly be. I, I don't want to lose what I've already gained. I don't want to go backwards. I want to keep moving forward and be changed into your glory. And I want, to, I want to keep growing. I'm not competing with other people. And I think Jesus talked about this in Luke 18 in the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Imagine this. The Pharisee was a religious person who thought, like, I'm not as bad as other people. Actually, I'm doing pretty good. Look at me. I'm actually not as bad as others. And he actually praised this way. In, in Luke 18, it says this in uh, verse 10 of Luke 18. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get, but the tax collector stood at a dense distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus is like, no, you're not trying to be better than other people. You missed it. All of us are getting in by grace and all of us are on this journey. We should be cheering each other on in, in the way that they're following God instead of saying, well, at least I'm not as bad as them and trying to stay ahead or, or just behind. That's not what we're doing. We're trying to be the best person that Christ 
has made us into and to hold the gains that he's worked so hard to place into our life. One more, I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared. You just say this, I wasn't prepared. People say, I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared. I, I wasn't ready for it. When I lost all my weight and I went on the road and got to a church like this and they said, we're gonna go out and have dinner and we went to a restaurant and I was like, oh, I wasn't prepared. Like, what am I supposed to eat at this restaurant? You know, so I bought a book called Eat This, Not That, okay? And, you know, you could open up to any restaurant and you could go, so I'd be like, all right, they brought me to Applebee's. What should I do at Applebee's? What should I eat? You should fast today. Oh, no! You know, like, oh, no. No, you can eat at Applebee's. You can do it. All right. So I, I learned, like, I had to be prepared. I had to be prepared. I went to Russia and, and I was training pastors there. And when I walked in, this one guy said, hey, if you need any drugs or alcohol or a prostitute, I said, I don't need any of that. I'm a man of God. He said, well, I've done that for other men of God. I said, you're not doing it for me. I, I'd never had anybody approach me like that. And I was under spiritual attack. I go to my room, I turn on the TV, there's pornography on there. I turn off the TV, I threw the remote on the floor. I went for a walk. I walk out to the streets in St. Petersburg, Russia. And there's pornography all over the ground. And I was like, I was not prepared for this attack. So I called my wife and I said, hold me accountable. I called another pastor in our church. I said, hold me accountable. I feel like I'm under a spiritual attack. Even if you're under attack, the Bible says that God will give you a way out. It says, the temptations in your life are no different from others experience in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. God is giving you an escape route. He's giving you a way out and he's saying, I've got this. Now, last one, and I close with this. This one is so devastating. It's learned helplessness. What does that mean? You have this excuse in your life that you can't hold on to the changes that God has made in your life because of your family. You say, we're Irish, it's never gonna change. You say, you don't understand, Pastor Rob, everyone in our family gets divorced, it's just the way it is. Pastor Rob, you don't understand, there's a voice in my head that says, I've, I'm gonna die broke and I'm never gonna do this and God's never gonna let me have an abundant life. And, and there's voices that you hear. It's a learned helplessness that you can't get past because you think that it's set in motion. I wanna tell you this, it's not set in motion. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You are more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. God is able to deliver you. His strength is strong enough. He's powerful. His arm is not short that he can't rescue you. He can change you and help you to be formed in his image. You are not what your previous family members were. It's a new day for you. It's a new day for you. And I know this in my own life because my mom was raised not far from here in Tampa. And, and her family was a mess. It was a mess, dysfunctional. Both of my uncles were in and out of prison. My one was in and out of the state pen over and over again. The other one committed suicide on a Hawaiian island. It was lost, it was dysfunctional. And in the midst of this, somebody tells my mom about Jesus Christ and she gives her life to Jesus Christ. He changes her and makes her new. She gets this new life and she says, we'll never go back. We'll never have that dysfunction. I'll get counseling, I'll get help. I will do everything I can to make sure that my family never lives in what our family used to live in. And I wanna tell you this now, all of her children are serving the Lord. All of her grandchildren are serving the Lord and it's been changed in Jesus' name. It can be changed for you. It can be changed for you. Learned helplessness, do not let those lies of the enemy say you're never gonna change, it's not for you. Change is possible and you can change in Jesus' name and you can keep the change forever and ever and ever. So God, I pray right now that you would help everyone to believe that they can change and the changes they've made, they're gonna hold on to the progress. They're not gonna let go of it. They're it's gonna be a different ending for them and for their family and they will keep the change in Jesus' name. You'll give them the strength to do that and we will give you the glory and the honor for keeping us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.